Hello, everybody. I'm happy to welcome Melanie Traversier today. Melanie is Associate Professor in Early Modern History at the University of Lille and member of the Institut <laughs> Universitaire de France. Her research focuses on the musical market and gender history in the in Enlightenment, Enlightenment Europe and colonies, especially on the career and mobility of musicians and on the connections between music, science, and innovation in the 18th century. She has written several books, including Gouverner l'Opéra, Une histoire politique de la musique à Naples, 1767-1815, published by École de Rome, École Française de Rome, Le Journal d'une Reine, Marie-Caroline de Naples dans l'Italie des Lumières, published by Chambalon, La musique a tel un genre, co-edited uh, at the edition de la Sorbonne, and related to perhaps the, the, today's topic, L'harmonica de verre, uh, Miss Davis, Essai sur la mécanique. C'est au siècle des Lumières, published by Le Seuil. Mélanie, last but not least, <laughs> is also a professional actress. And uh, her next show is Les Fâcheux uh, by Molière, uh, Château de Grignan, next summer. But in fact, I should say that next show is in two days at La Maison Française with uh, hopefully uh, Sylvain uh, and uh, Patrick Boucheron. Uh, so, uh, her talk today is dedicated to the professional and geographical literary of two women musicians in the Enlightenment Europe, the instrumentalist Marianne Davis and her younger sister Cecilia, an opera singer. Uh, Melanie questions the logic of invisibilization of professional women musicians at work in uh, the history of music. I would say that, uh, well, uh, it's a great uh, connection because her conference follows up the presentation just some weeks ago by uh, violinist uh, Marina Schisch, who just published uh, a book uh, in the title Musicienne de Légende. So for all these many reasons, we are so happy to welcome you here at the Maison Française. And Mélanie, it's, it's your turn. Dear Francois, dear Sylvain, uh, thank you for, for your generous words and dear friends, dear colleagues, dear students. Um, it's truly a great honor to speak before you in vivo and also online. Uh, thank you again to Francois, to Sylvain, to Courtney, your fabulous orchestra for your invitation. Uh, really, I'm very delighted to represent French research involved in transatlantic networks and to present topics developed in my book published last year, L'Harmonica de Verre and Miss Davis, Essay sur la mécanique du succès au siècle des Lumières. This essay is a sort of appeal for removing the barriers between the economic and social history of the performing arts, celebrity and musical testes, and the history of innovation and the collective processes by which in inventions are conceived, validated and spread. Let me salute through the airwaves, my editor, my dear editor, Séverine Michael at the Seuil edition. And let me confess what thing, what a great trip to cross the ocean again and uh, to uh, turn back in New York. Uh, since I am talking uh, about sea travel and since one ocean can hide another one, let's talk about a little sea, the English Channel in the 18th century. With Giuseppe Baretti, a famous Italian writer living in London at the end of the 18th century, is writing to Dorotea Celesia, the wife of the former ambassador of Genoa in London, is writing. Dear lady, I recommend to your protection two of your countrywomen who come to Italy with a view of being heard play upon a new instrument called harmonica. I hope you, uh, I hope you will be of service to them and bring all the handsome ladies at Genova to hear one of them to play upon that instrument and the other sing, etc., etc. The rind are recommended to musicians 
two English sisters of Irish origin, so they are Catholic. It's very important to travel to Italy in that time. And uh, their, their name, the Davis sisters. One, Marian Davis, is an instrumentalist. The other, Cecilia, a singer. And they are currently at the start of their careers. Nowadays, they are forgotten yet. It enjoyed widespread renown in Enlightenment Europe. Marianne, who first won fame as a child prodigy on the flute and on the harpsichord, went on to fascinate the music elites with performances on the glass harmonica, a crystallophone designed by uh, Franklin. You, Franklin. Benjamin Franklin. <laughs> uh, Cecilia Davis, meanwhile, her sister, made later a mark as the first English woman to be hired as a singer by theaters in Italy. She was called the Inglesina. The case uh, is both representative and unique. It is representative in that the vicissitudes they encountered were those faced by any woman making music a career, particularly if she remained single, as the Davises did. At the same time, the case is unique because on the one hand, their career path was that of two sisters who always lived and, to a degree, worked together. Marianne playing on the harmonica, Cecilia singing with her. On the other side, their story is also intertwined with that of the wacky reception of the glass harmonica. This was an innovative musical instrument designed, as I said before, by Benjamin Franklin. Franklin had transformed the rudimentary instrument of musical glasses into a veritable machine, a musical machine, as he wrote, as he explains himself in a famous letter to John Battista Beccaria, one of uh, his electrician colleagues at the beginning of the 60s. The change worked by Franklin is not only in appearance, is also in nature. Musical glasses, as you can see, lined up in front of the player, filled with a small amount of liquid and work by hand, as many of us will have played at the end of a great meal and perhaps we do again uh, tonight. So the, the classic musical glasses are transformed into the delicate and sophisticated instrument that is Franklin's harmonica. The instrument are 37 hemispheric glass balls of decreasing diameters, each corresponding to a different note. They are threaded onto a wood spindle made of iron. The spindle is attached to a wheel, which is put into a machine by a threader. After wetting the hands and starting the glasses spinning by operating the treadle, the player rubs one or more glasses, spinning, spinning by operating, the, uh, excuse me, as the player rubs one or more glasses at a time. It is up to the artist to generate actual tunes by uh, modifi modifying the rotational speed, the pressure applied to the glass, the number of glasses being rubbed, etc., etc. To spread warmth, word of his prototype, Franklin chose, chose as his first under his first player, the young English musician Marianne Davis. Uh, musical skills and the movements required to play our instrument were very well suited to standing at the glass harmonica and playing it in a way what quite sounds akin to Sue's of the German flute. She gave her first con con concert on the harmonica on 19 February 62 in London in the Great Room at the Springs Gardens. Ms. Davis will perform on the harmonica from its complete instrument capable of thorough bass and never a tune. This is the first and only instrument of the kind ever exhibited in public. The publicity accompanying these performances attests to the dual nature of the event. It was at once the exhibition of a new prototype and the performance of a virtuoso musician. Don't forget that science too was on show as with the demonstrations of electrical machines, chemical experiments, aerostatic flights, all those open air or stage mounted science experiments in the Enlightenment period. In the same way, a new musical instrument expertly mechanized and which is more by a scientist of international renown as was Franklin, also attracted the curious interested in technological innovation. 
So, Londoners, then Utaya audiences in British islands and on the continents were therefore drawn by both the mechanical curio and the musical instrument. The instruments, plus played by Marianne, then followed by other professional musicians, quickly enraptured the Enlightenment elite, who were enchanted by the purity and the harmony of its sounds. The instrument was never out of tune. It was like a cherubim in a box. The study of the uh, Davis's careers and the networks the Davis sisters mobilized directly or indirectly from Marianne's first stage's appearance on the obstacles, on the flute, and later on the harmonica, until Cecilia's death in 36, uh, in 1836, and conscious a triple historiography. The history of performer mobility and celebrity, of course, gender studies uh, crossing gender musicology, and the history of organological innovation, which itself belongs, of course, to the history of science and technology. The cases of the Davises invites us to study how women were also involved in the history of innovation. New light, indeed, is being shed on the involvement of the women whose influence derived from their belonging to the high or even very high aristocracy, but also to specific circle, artisanal or artistic, in which they had imposed their skills, their symbolic or economic or technical authority. In that context, one of the goals of my research is to identify which features were unique to the international mobility of male and female performers as compared to the overall dynamics governing professional circulation in the 18th century. So the minority of music professionals with international careers be regarded as privileged migrants or migrant elites to use the concepts proposed by the sociologists Sheila Crusher and the historians Marian Amar and Nancy Green as privileged migrants, perhaps thanks to their professions and recognized qualifications, perhaps they can enjoy more far flung and lucrative opportunities, more material resources, and more varied and stable solidarity and networks than other workers and travelers with fewer resources, connections, or education. Other question. What differentiations as regards circulation can be made within the music world itself, heterogeneous, contentious, and uh, of course, uh, also hierarchically organized in terms of the career involved, the degree of fame, the type of music practiced, as well as geographical, religious, social origin, and of course, not forgetting the performance standards. And of course, there is no single criterion that applies systematically or uniformly, and the uniqueness of profiles and context is an incentive to abandon a one-size-fits-all musician's analysis, analysis greed. Turning to the Davis's sister, the archives for research into the Davis sisters are extraordinarily illuminating. Even though there is far less certainty about the specific features of the careers of unmarried and nomadic women performers, than about those of their male counterparts, as well as for fewer documentary records. While it remains impossible to reconstruct the sisters' travels or biographies in detail, certain stages of their careers can be grasped through specific sources, which also make it possible to identify the networks and resources upon which they could draw during their professional lives. Two stages are in particular interest. There was a first European tour between 66, 67 and 73, and a second long stay in Europe between 78 and 86. During these two continental phases, the sisters sought to consolidate their reputation and subsequently to revive their careers after a number of disappointments. The professional and geographical mobility strategies corresponding to these two key phases are well documented, well documented in particular in a collection of reference letters and in letters the sisters themselves wrote when still active or hoping to remain so. These exceptional manuscript archives, exceptional because they, they were 
women and they were women uh, artists. This manuscript archives make it possible to suggest to suggest a typology of the networks female musicians mobilized according to the goal sought and its timing in their careers. It, make, it makes it also possible to identify the, identify the ways of empowering the rules directly or indirectly in an increasingly competitive music environment. And it helps us, it helps us to trace the outlines and limits of their agency as it was deployed, redeployed, and reconfigured to the advantage of one or the other sisters of both. Let's follow the sisters. From 67 to 73, Marian and Cecilia Davis crisscrossed part of continental Europe for the first time within the framework of a double, double job mobility project. For Maryland, this meant uh, increasing the number of glass harmonica concerts in Europe as she sought to boost her reputation already established in the British Isle. Uh, she wanted to introduce now the instrument in Europe in the, on the continent, following a brief first experience in Paris in uh, 60, 65, which opened her the door of Versailles courts. For Cecilia's travel, the objective is different. It was self-development intended to enable her to improve her vocal strength and accustom herself to stage, to the stage. Engagements were possible at Italian theaters would <coughs> enable her to earn a first royal stripes as an opera singer, as a professional opera singer. So for each of the sisters, this opera and travel plan focused on the Italian peninsula where musical reputations were built. L'Italia è la sede della musica, eh, conosciuto. Here, the story of the sisters meets the history of the Grand Tour as lived by artists that is undertaken primarily with promotional and professional aims in view, whether it was to uh, improve their musical or vocal qualities or to consolidate their reputation. On the musical side, it was, of course, the Italian star that drew through who dreamed of success and fame. The ops of the David, uh, of the David sisters were not, not different at this point for the Italian projects of many non-Italian musicians active in the same period. These included the composers, Johann Adolf Hasse, Johann Christian Bach, also Mozart, Craig Gaitry, and Miss Levice, as well as singers you came to perfect that trend. These trips with their professional goals, which only retrospectively took on the outlines of a tour. It's not like the tour, like uh, Beyonce organized this tour or the 60 tour of the Rolling Stones, I you know. Uh, this uh, tour uh, allowed artists to experience social circles and more outside their native milieus, as well as to expand their lists of contacts. These strategies centered on travel were employed relatively frequently by musicians aspiring to international renown, especially those who only had the stage on which to make their talents known. So for the sister, throughout his first five-year journey in Europe, they were accompanied and chaperoned by their parents. Their presence certainly guaranteed the sisters' safety and their morals, always of importance for young women travelers and musicians to boot. Above all, however, the, the parents provided unfailing material and organizational support, which of course freed the sisters from all but their artistic obligations. The first European tour by the Davis sister is documented not only in the printed record of their performances and a few eyewitness statements from individual members of their audiences, but also, and perhaps more, by a set of reference letters, exceptional, preserved in the Rocket Family Connection, currently held in the Dorset History Center. The collection of letters was amassed in the family archives of the Reverend Thomas Rackett because of his connection to the two musicians. 
Sydney was established at the very end of the 18th century when Wackett entrusted his daughter's musical education to the sisters who by then had withdrawn from the public stage. So the letters of recommendations for the Miss Davis uh, sets up uh, their European journey. The entries with very few exceptions appear in chronological order. Their references, uh, 132 letters of introduction between 67 and uh, 73. All the intermediaries had one objective, to ask the recipient to provide the Davis sister with material assistance, recommendations to other potentially useful contacts and good advice for continuing their professional travel plans. In the light of knowledge of the local music markets, the networks involved uh, and the authority figures in the targeted city, of course. So they have, they have to uh, give them assistance, direction, and consigli, as wrote Valerio Moretti. These letters of recommendation were a decided advantage in their training as performances as, as performers and still more so in a professional ascent that was based on international mobility. It was Betty Matthews in 1975 who unearthed these records and offered a first, in his, a first analysis by identifying tones at which the sisters talk and by drawing attention to some of those who acted as referees. My own research has deepened his early approach. On the one hand, I was able to make these networks uh, denser and more complex, and especially to expose the role of scientific networks keen to promote the harmonica designed by Franklin. And on the other hand, I studied the letters of recommendation tracing the promotional points put forward to sell the musicians and the instrument itself. This also entailed understanding how the letters constituted symbolic reputations. Their powerful effects on making appointments help shape emerging celebrities. So who, are, who were the brokers uh, mobilized by the networks? The networks that came to their, uh, to their aid to, uh, were primarily the ones established by their father who was himself a well-known uh, harpsichord player and flautist in London. But later, uh, after the first steps of the journey from the outset, the networks varied in the directory of referees. Intermediaries expected can be found. Musicians, of course, and other professional contacts from the artistic and intellectual world. Of course, we find also court and diplomatic networks and figures of the English and Catholic diasporas on the continent. So uh, our working vertical and horizontal solidarities, professional and court networks and supporters within the Anglophone diaspora in Europe. And as you can see, as you can see, correspondence between the sexes was not uncommon. Among these various characters, music lovers, members of the city and court elites, et cetera, et cetera, uh, who must largely be expected, another type of network comes as a greater surprise. This network, this network, this network identified is made up of members of scientific, of scientific circles who are especially active in the Italian, in the Italian peninsula. It was there that the artistic promotion of the two young musicians and that of the glass harmonica were most closely intertwined. If Italian Academy took an interest in the Davis sisters and especially in the glass harmonica, this was because it was designed, conceived by Benjamin Franklin. In on mechanical innovations, the scientific network extolled the Davis sisters because they brought the Franklin label. They call them Franklinian Fanchule, uh, Franklinian, uh, Franklinian girls. Um, let us also note that this net scientific network of experts was not exclusively male. We must applaud the major role 
played by Laura Bassi, a woman physicist with an excellent re reputation. It was she, uh, it was she who wrote personally uh, to uh, Giambattista Beccaria, to whom Franklin had written the famous letter of July 62 to inform him about the Davis's presence and harmonica performances in Italy. Laura Bassi was the main vehicle for promoting Franklin's instrument in Italy. And, uh -huh, be careful, the letter she, said she sent to Beccaria contains a scoop. The glass harmonica was the birth of electric music. <laughs> yeah, because the instrument was considered by her, like by the other uh, experts, like an electric machine. The sound produced by friction had the same nature and effects as electricity, as conceived in the Enlightenment period. Contemporaries were convinced by uh, these uh, similarities. In terms of renown, these successions of letters gained publicity for the glass harmonica, an instrument still rarely heard outside the British Isle and Paris. At the same time, the letters, among with the concert, developed the sisters' reputations. To begin with, they were presented simply as a David sister or uh, English country woman, and then gradually singled out by their first name and letter associated to Franklin's name. One of these letters provides the first documentary evidence, the first documentary evidence of the Italian language alias Ninglesina used to describe Cecilia Davis as she prepared for a stage debut at the famous San Carlo, the most prestigious of Italy theaters at that time. The sociological and geographical cartography of these brokers as recorded in the collection of letters, highlight a crucial stage. Vienna, it's a special dedication to David de Castle. Nice to find you here. Uh, meetings, uh, indeed, uh, were around there in Vienna that had a pivotal impact on the David's subsequent careers, particularly with the composer Hasse, who introduced them to the musical and aristocratic milieu of Imperial Vienna. The sisters performed uh, uh, a score written by Hasse for the Imperial Court, the first score dedicated, especially written but for the harmonica. And it was commissioned by the Empress Maria Theresa herself for a prestigious dynastic event. It was held at the Imperial Court uh, in the Great Gallery of, uh, at Schönbrunn, the wedding of Archiduchess Maria Amelia to Ferdinand Duke of Parma and Piacenza in 69. So the English sisters performed the uh, harmonica, a cantata with music by Johann Adolf Hasse and libretto by court poet Pietro Tapasi, known as Metastasio. So uh, really a VIP session for VIP uh, elites, uh, court's elite. The imperial interest for the glass harmonica was not only artistic, but also economic in the, context, in the context of the development of the Bohemian glass industry. The patronage uh, of the court uh, remained, as we can see, very effective too in building reputation and in promoting novelties of all kinds, even if it was more and more a case of relating success already gained in the cities. Um, here you can find uh, uh, indications on the direct help given by uh, Maria Teresa uh, as a powerful patron. She's also recommended, she also recommended the both musicians to her distinguished correspondence in the Italian territories under Habsburg dominations in Milan, in Venice, in Rome, and in Naples. Hasse, the composer Hasse also put the family in contact with Giambattista Ortiz, an economist and well-known writer. Ortiz uh, hosted the Davis's letter during their stay in Venice, which makes the start of their Italian tour. The first Italian experiments were barely conclusive, 
but it encouraged them to press hastily to on the uh, onto other places in the peninsula, thanks to contact made in Venice. Ortes, in particular, who would later engage a direct correspondence with both Marian and Cecilia Davis in the second part of their careers, especially during uh, the second tour in Europe. And the sisters would soon size on the powers of the written world for actively promoting their interest and, and discovering for themselves what opportunities were uh, presented by a specific term. It was only logical that they would do so, given that they were well-educated, uh, of a adult age now and fortified by the confidence bestowed by their first public stages on the continent. Later, the death of their father encouraged them to take up the pen themselves and to put it at work for the good of their professional projects. It is striking during their second stay on the continent. Documented by several letters, monographs, monographic letters. We know four letters which, with professional goals, less or more explicit, written by Marianne Davis and 10 by Cecilia Davis, relating to uh, the period 73 and 83, uh, that, uh, according to the non documentation. But we have them only because they were held in the archives of the men. They were two, Jean Battista Ortez and Again, Benjamin Franklin. So Franklin and yours forever. A means of action, of course, personal letters are, but they were not simply props for self-promotion. They also will leave a re reveal the role of professional performers as mediators, facilitating the movements uh, uh, of musicians, including across borders, thanks to their ability to settle in their respective diasporas and to their expert knowledge of music, uh, of artistic milieus. They make it possible, about what concerns the Davis sisters, uh, the graphs how during the lose in their professional timetables, the sisters tweet to secure new contracts, learn about the European music market, and of course, we launch their careers, especially once Marianne's mental fragility became known. It was a big problem for, for her, of course, but also for the uh, sisters' project. Indeed, after the first lengthy period in Europe already mentioned, the Davies family returned to London. But at that point, uh, a productive period began for Cecilia, who appeared uh, on London prestigious theatre stages as Linglesina, but for Marianne, the personal and professional fate was less fortunate because as of autumn 73, she was suffering from a nervous disorder that prevented her appearing a stage. We learned this from a digression in a letter sent as it happens to Ortes, their dear friends in Venice. From London, with apologize for the delay in telling him the news, she wrote, uh, my sister wouldn't have answered immediately, but she was much indisposed before we left Florence, as likewise during the journey. And on our arrival here in London, here grew still wars, which frightened us all extremely. The Marians, uh, the Ma the Marians illness led Cecilia Davis to take charge of the family and to conduct her career with a view of this family responsibility, but also uh, economic duty. It will be our task from then on to run the family business unit. In a correspondence with Ortez, Cecilia described their situation, mentioned projects and offers of work and occasionally gathered information that might one day be useful in approaching specific theater directors again on the continent. As give you some example here. Uh, for example, she was, uh, write me a few words to let me know if there is anything I can do for you here in London and on your part, could you let me have, if you don't mind, of course, news of the Teatro San Benedetto, 
one of the most famous uh, Venetian theater of that time, etc., etc. As you can see, once again, the Italian star shown brightest. The carrier plan doubled as travel work for reasons of health and for Marians opt, uh, opt for recovery. The dream of a new European tour was thus taking shape. After the collapse of uh, a Russian contract in St. Petersburg, the new trip to uh, Europe finally began in Paris in 78 in a climate of cultural ferment that might seem to have favored the Cecilia's hopes. Why? Hey, because, because, because uh, music, French lovers of that time divided into Gluckist and Piccinist were certainly enthusiastic about music. Furthermore, on there she could hope for the active support of Benjamin Franklin himself, who since arriving at the end of 76 had created a veritable steer, Franklin Mania, we can say. The old ties between the Davises and Franklins and the latter's confidence in Marianne shown in choosing her as the first to perform on his last harmonica, two arguments were all advantages to be highlighted uh, in order to succeed in Paris. So Cecilia had barely moved to Paris uh, with her sister and mother when she asked him about this directly. Help us, help us. Uh, and uh, she wrote several letters from Paris to uh, Benjamin Franklin, first to, uh, uh, first to uh, seek an alliance and uh, later to have more help to go back to Italy because the Parisian hopes were soon extinguished. Although Paris went crazy, that for love, that for Franklin, and his harmonica when he played it itself, the Davis sisters were unable to find suitable conditions in the city of, for a career revival. Marianne was held back by her illness and the Paris music scene in the grip of uh, the Wentless War between Lucas and Piccinis had no room for Cecilia. So the Italian option remained open. The two sisters went back there armed with a letter of introduction, which Franklin wrote for them in September 78. Sadly, as that letter do not survive, but Cecilia thanks him warmly for it in a letter, which implies that they are on the point of departure. Back on the Italian peninsula, the sisters settled permanently in Florence for many years. It was from uh, Florence that Marianne sent a wonderful and long letter to Franklin again, dated 26, 26 April 83. This letter is amazing because it simulates simultaneously an account of her life, a curriculum vitae, and a covering letter. The letter is far more explicit about a professional motivation than who Cecilia sent to both him and Ortez. These unique documents is both, as I say, a curriculum vitae and an enthusiastic appeal for references, attesting that Marianne Davis was fully aware of Franklin's influence. In a way, she writes to Franklin with courtesy, professionalism, and respect. <laughs> A letter briefs her on her reasons for self-promotion and the career path she hopes to pursue. She provides be, uh, to begin a list of setbacks, sad setbacks. Their mother has did after a long illness. Uh, Marianne herself uh, confessed that she experienced a violent return of her nervous complaints. The sisters were also victims of a, a, of a swindler after entrusting their savings to an ill-intentioned individual who brought them to financial wins. And last but not least, the great and good Empress Maria Teresa was dead. So what a pity, what uh, uh, so many things to be as she was utterly disgusted of the world. But after these side reminders, she changes tone and looks 
to the future, to the professional futures in terms of her career. Feeling better again, she has gone back to playing the harmonica and she's convinced she could live off, uh, she could live off the concert. She will, she will also be able to give. For this, her ambitions is seeking Franklin's intercession. She is trying to go back to Paris, thank the help, thank, uh, Franklin's help. She thinks Paris possesses all the advantages of a music capital to sustain her plans. Influential world patronage of cultural life, a public on the lookout for talented Italians, a variety of music institutions, and a queen. A queen, Mary Antoinette herself, daughters of Maria Teresa, passionate about music and also very curious of technical uh, innovation. So if the queen were to grant Mary Ann Davis a small pension, when added to the income, uh, the income she could make again from her concerts in Paris, it would save her from her predicament and allow her to live decently in Paris. By offering a patronage, Maria Antoinette would have lost to her cultural and technical patronage in Paris. So for all these reasons, Marian Davis begs Franklin to assist her in this life-saving enterprise and discreetly to let her have what she called a plan of establishment. And Marianne concludes uh, with a few words particularly concerned for her interests. In order to stock all the odds in her favor, she would like to retain something akin to an exclusive right to play the harmonica, which she, have, she has had historically. She asks Franklin to promise her that he will give no advice to any other professional musician, but also that he will not reveal any secrets of the instruments manufacturer. You will remark how strikingly close this comes to the industri industry privilege of the ancien regime. So this amazing letter often read uh, solely with regard to Marianne Davis's uh, misfortunes is extraordinary. It shows our woman, a performer, in an awkward situation, seeks professional support on the basis of economic, material, and artistic criteria. She reactivates our networks, even those with Franklin that have not been used for several years, but may still prove decisive. It reveals how she dangles the virtues and unique features of her artistic careers in order to achieve her objective. What an outstanding example of women's agency. So, happy end? No, <laughs> I'm sorry. Because you are not watching an, an American biopic, I'm sorry. It's a French history book, so. <laughs> Unfortunately, this extraordinary uh, unwritten letter went and answered. Franklin certainly reserved the letter because it entered in his, uh, it entered his archives, uh, as did the remainder letter, which followed in vain. So did he ignore it? Did he think it's pointless to reply? Or did he perhaps not have the time because uh, he was very busy uh, with uh, his diplomatic activities during those years in Paris? It is hard to reach a definitive conclusion. Anyway, without the social skills of the honorable vieillard, as Francis was identified in the French uh, archives and newspapers of uh, those years, uh, so without, the, uh, without Franklin's help, with no other support at the court of Versailles, plans to return to the French capital won a grant. It is not even certain that Marianne Davis shared the idea with her sister. So both, both sisters remained in Florence until spring 86. Cecilia was less and less in demand, however, and it seems that Marianne was once again affected by her nervous complaint, which took her away from the, uh, Tuscany, the Tuscan stage for good after what appears to have been one of last concert performance court. With no stable income and no professional prospects, but 
supported by the English British community in Tuscany, the sisters managed to find their return to London in, 60, in 86. It was then that the final part of their careers began. Marianne, uh, Marianne, Marianne Davis no longer appeared in public. Only Cecilia's performance contracts guaranteed them an income. Her career was also in decline as age and its impact on uh, her voice caught up with her. And she was, of course, outshone by fierce competition from younger, talented performers, winning renown also in Italian opera, Nancy Storace, uh, Gertrude Marat, uh, born as Schmeling. Here, the investigation on gender musicology encounters the aging studies. And uh, uh, Cecilia Davis was considered as being passé, it's a powerful <laughs> expression. From then on, institutional support, uh, from then on, with no institutional support possible from the exclusively male Wallace Society of Musicians, Cecilia Davis' one option was to teach music at home. Her work as music teacher for the Irwin Schwackers family was a sole source of income for both sisters. They left almost no further direct documentary traces. Just a few letters from Cecilia to the Rackett family, but without professional indication. A digression in one of the letters reveals the death of Marianne in December 1824. Cecilia enters uh, at that time the glass harmonica to uh, Reverend, uh, Reverend Rackett's daughter. It's the last indication we have of the glass harmonica prototypes owned by Marianne Davis. In the years that followed, as concerned linked to, uh, to uh, Cecilia's advanced age even prevented her giving any more music lessons. In this context of family isolation and growing poverty at the end of the uh, 20s, several women benefactors and then the National Benevolent Institution gave her, gave her some help. When Cecilia Davis did on 3 July 36, the news was announced in the London St. James Chronicle and General Evening Post. He carried a little obituary that gave a brief summary of her career, but failed to mention that of her instrumentalist sister. With the death of Cecilia Davis, all direct documentation mentioning the sister vanishes as does all information about Mar Marianne's harmonica. So you can see uh, the networks, uh, the Davis sisters might up to enlist or seem to undergo an inexorable geographical uh, and social economic shrinkage. The types of intervention become less and less direct as they were at the start of their careers, but are now far fewer in number. This was the shared fate of sick and aging stage professionals, especially if they were women performers, who remained unmarried and had failed to amass a fortune. Socially isolated, and gradually forced of the stage, only rarely with resources to any professional institution, soon forgotten and greatly impoverished, they were sentenced, like Cecilia Davis, to being passé. And there, were, there was no way back. In the end, charity became the sole means of offering them support. Ultimately, the most solid and dependable network on which they were to rely throughout their lives and their careers remained the one best on their solidarity <laughs> as sisters. Thank you for your attention. So if you have questions, yeah, thank you, so much. Uh, thank you so much for this really amazing uh, lecture, uh, passionate lecture. So it's time for questions. If you want to ask, and uh, probably there are some questions on the internet, uh, I can check.
So I can start. Uh, right, right, right. Well, could you say something more about the their uh, social media? I know uh, beyond uh, their cases, uh, but about the the status of a musician uh, as a woman, you know, and uh, and uh, you didn't say well a lot about uh, their. I don't know their their encounters, their love uh, affairs, or what was their life regarding this? Uh, because well, you said that yes, the, they didn't follow the path of uh, married women. So could you say something about the the, the life and the, the status of uh, of uh, female musicians in the eighteenth century? Mm -hmm. Oh yes, uh, uh, in fact, in Denmark. Yeah, sure. euh, alors, concernant les, les sœurs Davis, on n'a aucune information sur leur vie euh, sentimentale, euh, puisqu'on a déjà très peu de documents émanant euh, de euh, leur propre euh, voix. On a ces quelques lettres que j'ai mentionnées, dans lesquelles elles restent très euh, pudiques sur leurs relations. Les réseaux qu'elles évoquent sont uniquement euh, professionnels et euh, amicaux dans des réseaux euh, qui sont euh, donc liés euh, à la vie culturelle, euh, à la vie intellectuelle et euh, aux, aux élites devant lesquelles elles, elles jouent euh, de la musique. C'est un peu le sort de euh, l'ensemble des euh, instrumentistes, à l'exception peut-être des euh, chanteuses, des chanteuses d'opéra, qui elles sont sans cesse encombrées d'une mauvaise réputation euh, les anecdotes sont nombreuses au sujet de leurs amants. Euh, elles sont euh, protégées, comme les danseuses, hein, du oui, reste. Moi, j'ai Rousseau dans les confessions. Exactement. Donc, elles, elles seraient euh, forcément euh, protégées, euh, financées euh, par des amants euh, riches, socialement bien euh, placés. Tout ça, donc, euh, permettant de surtout parler de leurs aventures plutôt que de leurs qualités euh, artistiques. Et donc ça, c'est assez frappant dans euh, les, les témoignages même d'amateurs de, de musique. À chaque fois qu'on parle d'une femme qui s'exhibe sur scène pour faire entendre euh, sa voix ou euh, pour, faire, euh, pour euh, se produire comme euh, danseuse, c'est toujours ses relations euh, sentimentales, sa vie sexuelle, qui sont ainsi euh, euh, mises en avant plutôt que son, euh, que son talent. Ce n'est jamais, jamais le cas pour, euh, pour les musiciens, sauf s'ils sont des castras. Mais les castras sont-ils des hommes C'est un troisième genre euh, qui euh, est également euh, souvent décrit avec euh, ce mélange euh, de scandale et de fascination pour leur performance euh, vocale. Donc, on sait bien sur elles et sur leur vie sentimentale. On a des, un parfum de scandale, mais euh, euh, en tout cas, on, euh, sur les sœurs Alors, sur les sœurs Davis, euh, non, on ne sait rien. Elles ne se sont jamais euh, mariées. On a juste ce, ce noyau familial, euh, sororal, euh, qui apparaît euh, vraiment euh, à la fois comme un duo familial et économique. La famille est une cellule économique et artistique. Euh, et, et sans doute est-ce lié au fait que Mary Ann Davis ayant, ayant souffert de, de ces troubles psychologiques, sa sœur a sans doute renoncé non seulement à des projets professionnels, mais peut-être aussi à une vie euh, personnelle euh, plus épanouie. Mais ça, on peut inventer seulement. Je ne sais pas quelle langue vous voulez. Euh... Une diamante. Ah non. <rire> La langue de son choix. Ok, merci beaucoup pour, pour ta présentation. Euh, finalement, c'est un parcours européen très Habsbourg qu'elles sont. Et j'ai trouvé ça super intéressant puisque tu as très bien montré le rôle de Marie-Thérèse et surtout le rôle de ses enfants dans leur circulation, dans les systèmes de recommandation. Le fait qu'elles arrivent à Paris, ma question aurait été sur Marie-Antoinette comme Lorenzo da Ponte, qui lui part en 92, au moment où ils se font tous arrêter et donc se retrouvent sans emploi. Et, et quelque part, en fait, ce, ces parcours euh, me, rappellent, euh, me rappellent aussi le parcours de Lorenzo da Ponte et cette fuite, cette recherche d'emploi en permanence qui n'aboutit à rien. La solution de da Ponte, c'est de se marier. Donc, je pense que tu as répondu à la question, pourquoi est-ce qu'elle ne se marie pas Je ne sais pas. 
Euh, mais... D'un point de vue, on a la chance d'avoir ces mémoires. On a la chance ces mémoires. Voilà. Là, on n'a que quelques lettres mmh. euh, éparses. Et, 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 et je trouve super intéressant aussi le rôle de Benjamin Franklin dans ce contexte politique précis, puisque au début, elle, donc, si je comprends bien, elle circule dans, un, un, dans une diaspora britannique, dans un réseau britannique, et à un moment donné, la clé de ce réseau devient américain. Mmh. américain. Est-ce que tu vois, à travers leur circulation, une évolution dans le dans le réseau même de Benjamin Franklin, qui expliquerait l'absence de réponse, par exemple Est-ce que son intérêt devient trop atlantique à ce moment-là et donc il, il abandonne ses créatures, ses clients Alors, à, à aucun moment, la, la nationalité américaine de Franklin est évoquée comme un argument euh, promotionnel ou un contre-argument euh, publicitaire. C'est vraiment, euh, dans les années 60 et 70, Franklin le physicien, l'électricien, qui est euh, la clé euh, pour, euh, pour activer ces, ces autres réseaux parmi les, euh, euh, les autres euh, recommandants appartenant euh, aux élites sociales, euh, à la diaspora, euh, etc. Donc, je, je ne crois pas qu'il y ait cette, euh, cette dimension américaine, américanophile ou américanophobe qui joue contre les sœurs, y compris dans la documentation anglaise. Ensuite, lorsque dans les années 1780, elles reviennent à Londres et qu'elles ne sont plus, enfin que Mary Ann Davis n'est plus embauchée et que Cecilia Davis voit sa carrière sur scène péricliter, à aucun moment on dit non, mais c'est parce qu'elle est liée à Franklin, Franklin qui, voilà, à cause de qui on a perdu les United States, enfin les colonies. C'est vraiment pas le, le problème là, c'est vraiment les dynamiques propres. À, euh, au, au vieillissement euh, dramatique en termes professionnels pour des femmes artistes qui jouent à plein euh, et qui font que bah, petit à petit elles, sont, elles sortent de scène euh, en se, euh, donc, Cécilia, euh, Cécilia Davis en se reconversant dans la musique sacrée et puis ensuite dans les leçons de musique et puis ensuite euh, survivant grâce à la charité de, de quelques euh, euh, mais euh, en tout cas, durant la, la Franklin Mania, euh, de même qu'on a euh, des éventails euh, avec le dessin, enfin, le portrait de Franklin, on a euh, des produits dérivés euh, de Franklin de tout type, tout le monde se précipite à Passy pour entendre Franklin jouer euh, de euh, l'harmonica de verre. Donc, euh, euh, parce que c'est aussi, donc c'est Franklin, mais c'est aussi euh, cette euh, fascination pour une musique céleste que je vous invite à écouter peut-être euh, aujourd'hui, euh, pour vous rendre compte à quel point aussi nos oreilles ont une histoire et qu'on on est peut-être moins charmé euh, par les sons euh, de cet instrument, tel qu'il a été euh, reconstitué, reconstruit par euh, des, des butiers euh, ces dernières années. L'instrument de Franklin est conservé euh, au musée Franklin, mais il est broken, il, est, il y a un certain nombre de, de verres qui sont, euh, qui sont brisés, donc on ne peut plus en jouer. À la, au musée de la Philharmonie à, à Paris, il y a aussi un, un, un autre prototype qui est une version améliorée, réalisée par un certain Dedon, lié euh, aux Pays-Bas, donc on est toujours dans un réseau <coughs> aux Pays-Bas autrichien, un réseau à Habsbourg. Et là encore, c'est un instrument qui est, qui est en partie brisé, mais, mais qu'on peut voir dans, dans sa structure, dans sa physionomie et qui a été réalisé par Cousineau, le luthier de Marie-Antoinette, le, le fameux inventeur de la harpe à double pédale. Il voilà, y, y a cette imbrication euh, de, euh, de milieux euh, qui sont à, à cette frontière entre des mondes euh, techniques, euh, artistiques euh, et, et musicaux. C'est assez euh, fascinant. Et c'est ouais, absolument. Et en fait, je pense que là, c'est une méthodologie qui permet de travailler aussi sur d'autres populations invisibles. Comme je vois, le travail sur les musulmans en Europe, par exemple, on retrouve cette multiplicité des appartements qui, en fait, fait qu'on on, on réussit à, à retrouver comme ça des, des parcours de vie. J'aurais juste une petite une curiosité, euh, puisqu'il se passe plein de choses à Trieste dans les années 1770, notamment au niveau du théâtre où Hieronymus Mond essaye d'en créer un public. Est-ce que tu vois une mention de Trieste dans le Non, malheureusement, non. Non, il n'y a, a pas même de, de lettres envoyées euh, vers, euh, vers Trieste. J'ai trouvé aucune mention. Après, voilà, euh, peut-être que, tu vois, mm -hmm. mais en, en tout cas, dans le, euh, 
dans le livre, enfin, ce, ce recueil de lettres de recommandations, je, je crois me souvenir, je vais vérifier, euh, qu'il n'y a pas de mention de, de Trieste. Mais bon, je vais vérifier. Maybe my question is a little bit absurd, ah. but I'm wondering what the what does the in the lumière, the enlightenment has to do with your story? I know they were there at that time, but where and I know that Benjamin Franklin, you know, built his own vocabulary, and that science was in particular particular space at the time. But what do you see in the story from what I've heard? What makes it particular? to the 18th century and could the same story could have happened, let's say, in the 16th century or the 15th century? You see, because I'm trying yes, to find course. the angle of where this moment that is so transformative and many aspects of it, as we spoke about, are not really out to see. Mm -hmm. Is it more a story that where the 18th century remains very much in the absolutist years, and the transition is not necessarily personal. Merci, Judith, for this formidable question. In fact, it's a story pleinement des, des Lumières du 18e siècle. Le 18e siècle, c'est l'âge uh, de uh, l'innovation, de la multiplication, de l'accumulation des, des, des progrès techniques qui aboutissent à une frénésie pour perfectionner toutes les machines qu'il s'agisse de machines à tisser, de moulins à broyer les céréales, qu'il s'agisse de concevoir des piles pour les ponts, ou qu'il s'agisse aussi d'améliorer des instruments de musique. Il y a cette volonté, par la mécanisation, qui est vraiment le processus fondamental de cette... De cette obsession à augmenter l'utilité des choses, à les rendre plus performantes, euh, cette, euh, augmenter l'utilité des instruments, ça passe aussi par cette mécanisation qu'on voit à l'œuvre dans les autres domaines artisanaux. Et ça, c'est typiquement lié euh, au XVIIIe siècle, en lien avec euh, l'histoire, évidemment, technique et scientifique de cette époque et avec cet idéal euh, d'un progrès technique qui se fait de manière collaborative euh, et cumulative. Euh, et donc, euh, on fait euh, expertiser, euh, notamment à l'Académie royale des sciences, euh, ces inventions, pas pour gagner euh, un droit économique dessus, mais pour contribuer à euh, cette, euh, cette, euh, ce progrès du savoir euh, et euh, de la maîtrise de l'homme sur l'environnement, sur son euh, environnement. Et il y a, euh, dans, dans, euh, au même moment, euh, ce 18e siècle, c'est aussi euh, le siècle des sensibilités. Euh, et cet instrument est considéré comme celui qui ravit le plus l'âme, la, la, cette sensibilité euh, mise à nu en raison de son son particulièrement pur, harmonieux. Et donc, c'est comme si cet instrument faisait con converger cette passion pour la technologie et cette passion pour euh, l'épanouissement de la, de la sensibilité, euh, de l'émotion. Après, ces deux mondes vont se séparer au XIXe siècle. Il y aura d'un côté l'économie, l'artisanat, l'industrie, de l'autre, euh, l'art, euh, la musique. Mais au XVIIIe siècle, ces deux mondes sont complètement euh, encore euh, imbriqués. Euh, et la preuve, c'est que dans les archives de l'Académie royale des sciences, euh, ce sont des astronomes, des mathématiciens euh, qui euh, expertisent les nouveaux instruments de musique, à la fois parce qu'ils aiment la musique, mais pas que, parce que cela rencontre leur intérêt, leur curiosité, et pour euh, euh, la science et pour la musique, comme s'il y avait aussi une survivance euh, bah de, euh, de euh, la conception médiévale en fait, euh, des arts et des savoirs qui associait la musique à l'astronomie, à la géométrie, euh, bien sûr. Donc, euh, et, et, et bien sûr, les femmes. Donc, c est, c est, voilà. Donc, et par ailleurs, les femmes sont euh, 
invisibilisés ensuite dans le récit qu'on fait de cette histoire de l'innovation et de cette histoire de la musique, mais dès lors qu'on les cherche, ça demande certaines euh, ténacités, euh, ça demande aussi d'aller, en particulier lorsqu'elles sont restées célibataires, donc il n'y a pas de traces dans des archives notariées de mariage, de naissance, d'enfants, etc. Ça demande à, à naviguer dans euh, un monde documentaire très varié, les archives diplomatiques, les archives techniques, euh, bien sûr les classiques, euh, la classique documentation euh, euh, des concerts, la chronique euh, musicale, on va dire, des témoignages euh, de... Euh, et là, on arrive à retrouver des indications sur ces femmes instrumentistes, virtuoses, qui ont été très applaudies, euh, sur ces femmes aussi qui ont été associées à la fabrication de ces instruments innovants, parce qu'elles étaient nièces, sœurs ou épouses de, de luthiers ou de facteurs d'instruments, ou parce qu'elles ont favorisé par leur surface sociale ou euh, par leur propre euh, curiosité, euh, la conception de, de nouveaux instruments. Euh, mais tout ça a été euh, effacé dans l'écriture savante de l'histoire de la musique et de l'innovation telle qu'elle s'est constituée, telle qu'elles se sont constituées euh, au XIXe siècle. Et donc, il faut ressaisir euh, par la documentation, euh, par cette exhumation de la documentation, euh, ces, ces éléments pour pouvoir réécrire en fait, pas réécrire, réécrire au sens complété et donner à lire une histoire mixte et de l'innovation et de euh, l'histoire de, euh, de la musique. Par ailleurs, donc ça, effectivement, c'est une histoire propre au XVIIIe siècle par rapport au XVIIe, XVIe siècle, etc. Et par ailleurs, comme je disais, c'est une histoire typique aussi du XVIIIe siècle, euh, eu égard aux évolutions ultérieures, parce qu'on n'a plus ce rapport euh, charnel euh, entre musique, science et technique, sensibilité et innovation et on a aussi nos propres goûts, nos propres, euh, notre propre sensibilité musicale n'est plus celle euh, des, euh, des Lumières donc euh, c'est aussi ce qui m'intéressait dans, dans ce, ce projet, dans cette enquête c'était de comprendre euh, à travers cette histoire croisée d'un instrument de Franklin euh, des euh, Sir Davis, comment euh, les, lumi les lumières nous sont aussi étrangères, euh, nous disent quelque chose qui nous échappe et ne peuvent pas être uniquement euh, résumées à euh, être la matrice de notre modernité. Il y a une spécificité des lumières qui n'est pas nôtre, qui même nous est peut-être incompréhensible. Et cet instrument me semble-t-il, euh, nous invite à questionner cette étrangeté des lumières. Pourquoi cet instrument a-t-il suscité autant de passion Et aujourd'hui, vous voyez, même si bien sûr, euh, Björk, mm. Damon Albarn, parce que ce sont des, 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 des génies euh, de l'invention euh, de, de musicale, euh, ont exhumé à leur tour cet, cet instrument, qui devient donc peut-être post-moderne n'est pas moderne, mais peut-être qu'il est déjà post-moderne. Euh, Est-ce que c'est uh, harmonica also help health? Yes. It's connected to Mesmer? Oui. Alors, euh, c'est un autre chapitre que j'aborde dans, euh, dans l'ouvrage. Comme tous les instruments de, de musique, euh, l'harmonica de verre est, est intégrée, est réintégrée euh, au, au, au débat sur les effets euh, thérapeutiques ou toxique de la musique au XVIIIe siècle, on fait rejouer le, le, en fait, le débat platonicien, hein, c'est vieux comme les, tous les discours sur, sur la musique et, et ses effets euh, sociaux, mais simplement c'est réintégré dans la médecine des lumières, donc dans la médecine des nerfs, euh, en lien aussi avec le développement de l'électricité médicale. Et donc, euh, quels sont les effets des sons, et des sons en particulier produits par l'harmonica, sur celles et ceux qui en jouent et celles et ceux qui écoutent. Euh, et donc, ça dépend euh, de son âge, ça dépend de son genre, ça dépend euh, de sa profession, euh, et puis euh, ça dépend de, devant qui donc, euh, on joue. Et donc, l'instrument, il est d'abord euh, valorisé comme un instrument de soin pour guérir la mélancolie. 
euh, il, il ravit, il transporte dans une harmonie euh, céleste, etc., etc. Mais le pas est mince entre le raffissement et la dépossession de soi. Et donc, après avoir été intégré à des, à des soins thérapeutiques pour guérir la mélancolie, ou avoir été intégré par Mesmer dans euh, ses séances de, de baquet, notamment pour guérir les maladies euh, de femmes, euh, l'instrument progressivement est décrié par certains médecins, pas par tous, euh, en tant qu'il euh, provoquerait euh, une dépossession euh, de soi, il provoquerait euh, euh, la folie euh, jusqu'à des gestes euh, suicidaires. Euh, et, euh, et finalement, ne va rester au début du 19e siècle euh, que euh, de, de cette harmonica qui, qui, aura, qui aura été balayée de toute façon par le souffle révolutionnaire. Vous l'aurez compris, c'est un instrument euh, aristocratique, élitiste, donc il n'a aucune chance, évidemment, dans, dans ce contexte politique. Aucune chance non plus, non plus d'un point de vue acoustique par rapport au piano, qui est le super vainqueur, euh, évidemment, euh, dans, euh, dans l'histoire de cette palette euh, orchestrale. Et puis, euh, il est donc euh, en partie euh, dénigré, euh, disqualifié en raison de ses effets toxiques potentiel sur la santé euh, et seuls les romantiques vont conserver euh, cet instrument euh, de verre comme un, un, un modèle pour, pour accéder à, à, à la plus grande euh, à, à leur pleine euh, expression de leur sensibilité donc Chateaubriand Madame de Stade je vous dis les romantiques c'est vraiment eux, euh, en font euh, cet instrument euh, romantique par excellence euh, de, euh, de la rencontre avec le, le soi profond euh, et puis euh, ensuite euh, au milieu du siècle euh, la mélophobie qui va, qui va s'emparer aussi des littérateurs euh, du milieu du siècle Flaubert pour commencer euh, finit de démolir la réputation de l'harmonica de verre qui tombe en, dans, euh, dans l'oubli complètement. Hein. Euh, voilà, donc là, euh, dans toutes les dimensions de, de cet instrument euh, sont euh, balayées. Et est-ce que son, her nervous illness was attributed to her playing the music? Alors ça, pas à l'époque. Euh, euh, les troubles euh, dont a souffert euh, Marianne Davis, qui sont donc réel parce que moi je me suis interrogée, parce que la légende, euh, l'écriture au XXe siècle de l'histoire de cette harmonica dit « et elle est tombée malade parce qu'elle jouait de l'harmonica, ça l'a rendu folle ». Mais en fait, on n'a aucune trace, euh, on a bien une trace de sa maladie nerveuse, c'est pour ça que c'est très intéressant de revenir à, aux lettres de sa sœur qui confirme, et puis elle-même le dit dans sa lettre à Franklin, mais à aucun moment le lien n'est fait euh, ni par euh, les médecins cités par euh, Cecilia Davis, ni par Marianne Davis, avec son instrument. Euh, et euh, en fait, euh, l'empoisonnement, euh, nous dit la légende qui s'est écrite à partir du XXe siècle, serait lié au plomb contenu euh, dans, euh, la, euh, dans les bordures de ces euh, cloches de cristal. Fake news. Voilà. Mais ça aurait pu marcher. Mais en fait, il n'y a pas assez de plomb et puis on ne frotte pas assez longtemps. Il faudrait passer vraiment des journées. Des journées. Donc, en fait, euh, elle-même n'a sans doute pas été euh, rendue malade par son instrument. Mais ce qui est intéressant, c'est que d'autres musiciens, des musiciens hommes qui ont joué de l'instrument, se sont inquiétés des effets de euh, leur pratique à l'harmonica de verre sur leur propre santé. Mais c'est bien connu, les hommes sont plus fragiles. Et, euh, et donc, euh, un certain nombre d'entre eux, notamment un certain Relais, a écrit un texte, un véritable manuel, comment jouer euh, de manière prudente et aviser de l'instrument euh, de verre et conserver sa santé. Euh, lui fait, fait le lien euh, avec d'autres médecins entre sa pratique de l'instrument et de potentiels dangers pour... Euh, pour la santé mentale, mais qui serait liée donc euh, à, euh, à la nature du son et aux effets du son, la transmission du son 
sur les nerfs de celui qui en joue, de lui ou celle qui en joue, et euh, du, euh, du public. Et à partir de là, en fait, toutes les théories sont possibles. Ça peut provoquer l'érotomanie des femmes, évidemment, qui écoutent, de celles qui en jouent, euh, jusqu'à euh, la déraison. Euh, et donc, à partir de là, l'instrument céleste, angélique, devient l'instrument du diable. Et donc, euh... Oui, mal. Je, je répondais juste parce que je le trouve très intéressant. Je rebondissais juste, c'est une remarque, mais je trouve ça très intéressant de voir dans quel sens va la légende auprès de Marianne, euh, la légende de justement l'effet de cette musique euh, et la possession notamment de cet instrument euh, qui irait dans le sens voilà, de, de la folie, alors même que euh, initialement euh, euh, les sons produits, les sons célestes que vous avez évoqués, euh, produits par cet instrument, ont été utilisés par d'autres, notamment des mmh. euh, dans la cure, dans une forme de cure. Donc je trouve intéressant qu'il y ait une distance qui soit faite avec le musicien homme, euh, une distance euh, et, et, où l'instrument tiendrait comme une cause euh, extérieure d'ailleurs. Là où, pour euh, le cas de Marianne, qui est une flamme, euh, il y aurait vraiment cette, cette descente vers la folie. C'est intéressant de voir dans quel sens va la légende, je trouve. Parce que là, du coup, c'est des sens tout à fait contraires. On a la cure dans un cas et, et finalement, euh, la descente vers la folie dans l'autre. Donc, euh, voilà, c'est un très génial que j'entends, mais je trouve intéressant. Oui, oui c'est euh, très intéressant, là, c est, c est, cette remarque en, en piasme. Euh, en quelque sorte, euh, qui m'amène aussi à rappeler que des grands compositeurs du XVIIIe siècle euh, ont écrit euh, pour l'harmonica et ont joué de l'harmonica. Je citais Hasse, mais parmi euh, ceux qu'on euh, qu connaît du XVIIIe siècle, Mozart en personne, qui a rencontré les Sœurs Davis à Londres, puis qui les a retrouvés à Vienne et encore une fois en Italie, tout ça est un tout petit monde, à Vienne, euh, euh, Mozart donc, retrouve les Sœurs Davis, découvre euh, l'harmonica de verre de Mesmer, qui est très liée à la famille Mozart, et il compose plusieurs pièces pour l'harmonica de verre, et à aucun moment, euh, on a considéré que c'est cela qui avait rendu euh, fou, euh, fou Mozart. Beethoven aussi a écrit pour l'harmonica de verre, Nauman, et toute une série de musiciens aussi qui sont liés au réseau maçonnique, parce que c'est toujours pareil, hein, instrument céleste, instrument de l'harmonie des sphères, et donc, vous voyez comment c'est vraiment euh, tout le monde des Lumières, les mondes des Lumières qui se précipitent euh, qui, euh, dans ces 37 bols de, de cristal. Exactement. Exactement, c'est le 18e siècle. Um, we have a web question <coughs> from our own Silva Hill. Uh, Hello, She says, thank you for this fantastic and inspiring talk, Melanie. I can't tell you how much I wish I could be uh, with you in the room. Um, en fait, elle a déjà répondu en partie de tout cela, uh, mais je, je vais poser les questions quand même. Uh, deux questions que je formule approximativement à la clé. Savons-nous si la pratique des sœurs Davis de, de, a produit des infléchissements particuliers dans le discours critique, technique ou scientifique sur la musique? Deuxième partie. <coughs> dans quelle mesure euh, la fortune de la harmonica avec ses sons, soit électriques, célestes, etc., participe? d'une certaine vraie définition du sublime en musique à la fin du XVIIIe siècle du côté de la technicité de la mécanisation. Merci, Sibel. Uh, be careful, don't listen to harmonica's musical glasses. I know you, you are ill, so be careful. Uh, alors, um, uh, uh, effectivement, uh, euh, euh, le, les sœurs Davis elles-mêmes n'ont pas commenté leur propre euh, façon euh, de, euh, de jouer. Donc, ce ne sont pas elles qui ont pu infléchir les discours sur la musique. Ce sont les commentateurs, les music lovers, euh, hommes ou femmes d'ailleurs, euh, qui ont, à partir euh, de euh, leur expérience sensible de spectateurs, spectatrices, auditeurs, auditrices, 
définit euh, cette musique euh, céleste. Euh, céleste et harmonieuse d'abord parce qu'elle ne se désaccorde jamais. Il faut bien considérer aussi ce, ce point-là qui nous sépare des, des lumières, c'est que nous, on est habitué à pouvoir accorder nos instruments assez facilement ou réaccorder. Euh, à l'époque, euh, c'est un problème énorme, en fait, euh, de pouvoir euh, avoir le son juste. Et une fois qu'on a réussi à concevoir cet instrument, à trouver les bonnes formes de verre, euh, Franklin considère que pour euh, avoir le, un, une cloche de telle taille, de bonne qualité, il faut en fabriquer six. C'est au bout de six qu'on arrive au bon diamètre, au bon ciselage, etc. etc. Mais une fois que l'instrument est constitué, euh, la qualité de son son ne bougera plus. Et donc, c'est passeport pour la voix céleste, quoi qu'il arrive, pour toujours. Euh, et on peut en plus transporter cette harmonica, évidemment fragile, hein, comme il est fait en cristal, dans une boîte de, de bois précieux qui permet de, de le transporter euh, aisément. Et donc, c'est cette musique qui semble être la musique des sphères sur Terre, euh, qui, est considérée comme, euh, voilà, qui de, est considérée comme le sublime euh, musical. Donc on est vraiment euh, au, au point d'aboutissement euh, de l'histoire des sensibilités musicales euh, à la fin du XVIIIe siècle à travers cet instrument. Et puis les, les médecins eux aussi euh, euh, se sont emparés de ce cas limite c'est un cas limite, est-ce que c'est un, est -ce est un instrument, est-ce que c'est un objet, euh, est-ce que c'est un instrument de musique, de divertissement, est-ce que c'est un instrument mécanique, comme il y a des instruments de physique, comme il y a des instruments textiles, est-ce que c'est un objet précieux, un meuble, un meuble qui vient décorer un, une belle euh, résidence. Donc ce cas limite, euh, il a été aussi intégré par, euh, dans le discours euh, des, des médecins pour euh, définir... Euh, la musique thérapeutique, mais avec toute une série de, de précautions euh, pour préserver euh, le sort de chaque malade en fonction de son sexe, de son âge, de sa profession, etc. etc. Euh, il y a une autre question que j'ai oublié, j'ai envie de dériver, là, je ne sais plus. Oui, ça y est, je retrouve par rapport à la question par rapport à la mécanisation et euh, à l'art du musicien. Euh, ce, qui est, ce qui est très important, c'est de se souvenir que Marian Davis a d'abord été célèbre comme, musique, comme enfant prodige. Et ces enfants prodiges, il n'y a pas que Mozart, il y a une cohorte d'enfants prodiges euh, qui fascine les, les, les publics de Londres, mais aussi de Paris et de toutes les grandes capitales européennes, parce qu'ils semblent euh, justement incarner euh, les qualités suprêmes dont peut faire preuve un être humain euh, en termes euh, artistiques et comment, même avec le plus jeune âge, on peut acquérir une dextérité telle qu'elle en devient gracieuse et naturelle. Euh, et donc, en, euh, en parvenant à, à, à jouer de manière euh, si virtuose qu'elle semble évidente, comme on voit un danseur euh, aujourd'hui, un, un danseur dans ses étoiles, euh, comme si c'était facile, euh, comment voilà, euh, cette facilité artistique en scène euh, est, est en fait le produit d'un travail répétitif, acharné, mécanique, mais qui est effacé dans la performance. Et c'est ça que, euh, qui est révélateur avec les enfants prodiges euh, qui euh, pousse ce, ce curseur de, euh, des qualités exceptionnelles de l'homme euh, le, le plus loin euh, possible. Et donc, dans les archives de la euh, Royal Society, euh, l'équipe, la, la, l'Académie des sciences britanniques, on trouve toute une série de rapports sur les enfants prodiges. Mozart, mais pas que Mozart. Euh, D'abord, on veut prouver qu'ils qu ont bien l'âge qu'ils ont, euh, qu a, quelle a été leur, leur formation Comment sont-ils devenus aussi euh, remarquables Et en fait, on questionne les rapports entre nature et culture, entre euh, euh, l'éducation et l'art. Enfin, C'est assez fascinant de voir tous ces, ces questionnements euh, pris dans les réflexions des grands savants de cette époque, soit physiciens, électriciens, naturalistes, peu importe, euh, où l'enfant prodige musicien, 
mais qui peut être aussi un enfant prodige mathématicien euh, et aussi quelques cas, euh, permet d'explorer, de questionner les limites supérieures de l'humanité. Euh, bah, J'ai pu euh, peut-être répondre à ta question, Sylvain. J'espère que tu l'as fait. Je crois qu'on peut conclure là et remercie beaucoup Mélanie pour cette très belle intervention. Et venez mercredi.